nothing and it went off and you got no, no, This member decapitated. It's probably because you're trying to hide something and make sure certain details don't come out. Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Ten to Life, where we talk all things true crime. So if you're brand new stopping by for the first time, welcome. I hope you enjoy today's case video. And if you do, please consider becoming a subscriber and hitting that subscribe button below so that you get notified of live streams as they happen in real time and new case videos as they get posted. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much. I love you. You already know what we do here and there's no need to tell you what we do. So before we jump into today's case, I just want to do quickly say thank you because over the last few days, many of you guys have been extending your warm wishes, your outpouring of love, because a lot of you know that my husband, myself, and our kids have tested positive now for COVID. Obviously, a little bit scary considering Emmy is just three months old and Theo is just two and a half, but luckily, all of us are okay. It honestly started as just it felt like it was a cold and we had, you know, a little bit of a scratchy throat, had a runny nose. We assumed it was a cold. I was popping Dayquil and then we started hearing that this new variant is disguised as a cold. So we decided, okay, let's just err on the side of caution. Let's get tested. And sure enough, all of us got tested and all of us were positive. And while my husband and I are champs and, you know, we can figure it out no matter what, we of course were worried for our two kids because Emmy's only three months and Theo's only two and a half. But luckily, they aren't showing any crazy severe symptoms, just again, like a mild cold, a little bit of a fever here and there. And I think that we're all for the most part on the mend. So it could be so much worse. And we are very grateful that it is not worse, even though isolation during the holidays is not fun. But anyways, I just wanted to say thank you for all of you guys who have reached out and sending your well wishes. We really appreciate it. And so the case that we're going to be talking about today is the case of Jennifer Dulos, and there's actually an update in this case. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Jennifer Dulos case, it takes us back to 2019, so not very long ago. And this case was often referred to in the media as the real-life Gone Girl case because not only were the circumstances extremely similar to the book in this case, but there were so many twists throughout this case. I am talking things that you would never think we're going to happen. So before we go into the update, because I think we are a step closer to figuring out where Jennifer is, and we're going to get to that because it's one more twist in the case of how we're now learning of all this new information. But before we get there, I want to give you guys a quick summary and rundown of the case, because as I mentioned, there are so many twists, there's so many fascinating details. So let's just quickly run through the case so that you're all caught up to speed, and then we'll go through the updates. Jennifer farber Julos was born on September 27th, 1968, and she was born in New York City. She graduated from Brown University in 1990, and later she earned a master's degree in writing at NYU. Now, Jennifer is said to have come from family money. Her parents are reportedly very well off. She grew up in New York City, this very established lifestyle. She ended up becoming a stay-at-home mother, and she made a living as a writer on Patch.com, and she also ran her own blog. By all accounts, Jennifer was an amazing person. She's absolutely beautiful, which you can see from these images, but also just a kind spirit, wanted to help others, and just a light to be around. In 2004, Jennifer married a man named Fotis, Fotis Dulos, hence Jennifer Dulos, and they originally met while they were both attending Brown University. Fotis was born in Turkey and grew up in Athens, Greece, and he moved to the U.S. in 1986. In 2004, in 2004, Fotis founded a real estate development group where he was specializing in luxury homes based in Connecticut, which is right outside of New York City. And again, it's said that Jennifer comes from family money while Fotis does not. And he had to really establish himself and earn his own living. And I say that because it is a very important detail that we will get to here in a minute. Shortly after marrying, the couple moved to Farmington, Connecticut. They had five children together, including two sets of twins. All of them were named after Greek Orthodox saints. They had three sons, Pedros, Theodore, and Constantine. I'm so, I'm hoping I'm saying that right. And two daughters named Christiane and Cleopatra. While you would think that this couple had a picture-perfect marriage, I mean, both very good-looking, this beautiful mansion in Connecticut, five children, two which are sets of twins, you would think that life couldn't get any better, 
But unfortunately, behind the scenes, as we know happens in so many marriages, there was a lot of turmoil going on. And in a blog post back in March 2012, Jennifer alluded to trouble in her marriage. She says, I wish I were a strong person and that confrontation did not both scare and appall me. And this apparently had been something that had been happening for a long time in their marriage. And after this gradual breakdown of their marriage in which Jennifer claimed Fotis was living an increasingly independent life, she ended up filing for divorce in June 2012. 2017. That same month she filed for divorce, she started renting a house in New Canaan, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I've heard it said a few different ways, and that's about 70 miles southwest of Farmington, Connecticut, and she moved into this house with her five children. In the divorce documents that Jennifer filed, she states, I know that filing for divorce and filing this motion will enrage him. I know he will retaliate by trying to harm me in some way. She also stated that she believed he was having an affair with his colleague, Michelle Traconius. Remember that name? name. She also alleged that Fotis had threatened to kidnap their children if she did not agree to his terms in the divorce settlement. She continued to say that he bought a gun that year and he was making all sorts of different threats. However, Fotis denied making these threats and claimed he bought that gun legally for home security. This divorce got very, very nasty and both parties were filing numerous motions claiming that the other was disparaging him. It got very, very ugly. Despite Jennifer's requesting an emergency order of custody, the couple was given temporary joint custody of their children until the divorce proceedings ended. Jennifer again requested an emergency custody order in 2018. The judge did say that he noticed that Fotis had broken multiple court orders. So Jennifer ultimately in 2018 was awarded sole physical custody of the children, yet they both continued to share legal custody. Fotis was granted supervised visitation and monitored phone calls. Now here's where things begin to get a little bit suspicious. The first red flag that goes up. In February 2018, after Jennifer's father died, she, her mother sued Fotis for unpaid loans because apparently he took out loans from his in-laws in the amount of $1.7 million and he failed to pay that money back. So she then was suing him for this money. And remember, it's reported that Jennifer comes from family money while Fotis has nothing to his name you know, self-earned. So here you have a very tumultuous divorce, a nasty custody fight. You have money involved, which we know money always makes things very, very messy and oftentimes is a means for motive. And shortly after the lawsuits were filed, shortly after the custody arrangement was in place, everything came to a head in 2019. May 24th, 2019 was a normal day, a day like any other. It was 8 a.m. Jennifer was dropping her children off at school and she returned home just five minutes away from the school at 8.05 a.m. That afternoon, she had two scheduled appointments, but she never made it to those two appointments. She had one scheduled for 11 a.m. and one scheduled for 1 p.m., both in New York City. And again, Connecticut is right outside of New York City, and so the commute in doesn't take very long, so this isn't out of the normal to have appointments in the city. But what wasn't normal is the fact that Jennifer never showed up to these appointments and didn't call to cancel nothing. Later that evening, around 7 p.m., two of her friends, including her nanny named Lauren, reported her missing to the police after they failed to get in touch with her all day. Family and friends of Jennifer stated that it would be very out of character for her to just fly off the radar, not be in contact, not talk to her children, and not show up for these appointments. Jennifer's nanny Lauren also told police that she was very surprised because when she arrived at the house at 1130 that morning, she noticed that Jennifer's Range Rover was in the garage. And this struck her as odd because that was the car that she knew Jennifer was planning to take into the city to go to so those appointments that she had scheduled. Coincidentally, her second car, which was a Suburban, was missing, and Lauren knew that she wouldn't have taken that car into the city. Not only is it huge and a gas guzzler, but hard to park, I get it why somebody would take a Range Rover instead of a Suburban all the way into New York, 100%. So she told detectives, this is really odd. The Suburban's gone. The Range Rover's here. Something's weird. And on top of that, on top of family and friends not being able to get in touch with her, on top of the interesting car situation, a cleaning service also showed up around noon to the house and Jennifer wasn't there. So detectives come to the house and they, of course, search the house. And what they noticed was an alarming scene. They found blood spatter on the floor, on a door, and on a wall in the garage, as well as on the exterior of the Range Rover. Blood was also found in the kitchen on a faucet. And soon, DNA test results showed that most of the blood belonged to Jennifer's, apart from blood that was on that kitchen faucet, which was a mixture belonging to not only Jennifer, but her husband, Fotis. This immediately looks to be 
foul play. So search dogs and search teams scour through the wooded areas behind Jennifer's house, as well as a 300 acre park, bodies of water and a cornfield, all just looking for Jennifer. Authorities also spent days on end searching at a large dump facility and scouring Fotis's property in Farmington, because remember, they found his blood on that faucet as well. So where was Jennifer? It was known that she and Fotis were in the middle of this nasty divorce and custody battle. And remember, where there's money, there's usually motive. And Jennifer had a lot of money. And it's been rumored that Fotis carried a lot of debt. Luckily, there would soon be a break in the case. Jennifer's Suburban was captured on the neighbor's security camera, leaving her home at around 1025 that morning. But remember, Lauren, the nanny, said that Jennifer wasn't going to take the Suburban and that Jennifer was going to take the Range Rover to her appointments. So Fotis was the one to be believed driving that Suburban that was captured on the footage at 1025 a.m. As detectives started their investigation, all roads were pointing to Fotis. He had the motive, he had the means, and he had the opportunity. And even more, Fotis was in a new relationship with that woman, Michelle Draconius, the one that Jennifer suspected he was having an affair with. So could he have just wanted Jennifer's money, the children completely in his possession so that he could start this new life with Michelle? Police continued their search, and they searched numerous properties in and around Farmington, including near any properties near Fotis' home, all without success. But then they started pulling video footage and Fotis's movements that day, and what they discovered is damning. They saw who appeared to be Fotis behind the wheel and allegedly his girlfriend Michelle Tracronius in the passenger seat. As the investigators are following along with this footage, they see that he makes multiple stops throughout Connecticut, disposing of what is alleged to be evidence in multiple trash bins. The footage takes place at approximately 7.30 p.m., that same day that Jennifer went missing, and Fotis and Michelle were captured on video dumping garbage bags in 30 bins in Hartford, Connecticut. 30 bins, guys. The trash bags were, of course, recovered and examined, and they were found to contain various pieces of bloodied clothing as well as bloodstained cleaning items. Not looking good for Fotis, not looking good for Michelle. The blood on these items was in fact determined to be Jennifer's. Fotis's DNA was found on the inside of a glove in one of the trash bags as well and on one of the trash bags. I mean, it just sounds like a really messy cleanup. If you're going to these lengths to try to dispose of evidence and get rid of evidence and you're going to 30 bins across the state, the least you could do is try to wipe your DNA off what you're throwing away. It just seems like a sloppy job to me. So on June 1st, 2019, just a few days after Jennifer was reported missing, Fotis and Michelle were arrested at a hotel in Avon, Connecticut. They were charged with tampering with evidence and hindering prosecution because at this point they didn't have enough evidence that existed in order to charge them with anything else and in or to charge them with murder charges. They only had enough evidence against them to give them the tampering with evidence charges. According to the arrest affidavit, investigators found in part, and I'm going to read this to you guys because it is a laundry list of things, bags of bloodstained clothing and sponges that Fotis allegedly dropped into trash cans at businesses throughout Connecticut, stains of blood on Jennifer's garage floor, blood spatter in numerous areas of Jennifer's home, Fotis's DNA mixed in with Jennifer's blood on that kitchen faucet, obvious attempts to clean up the scene, altered Connecticut license plates that belonged to Fotis, security footage of Fotis driving his Ford pickup to various locations, dropping trash bags into different public trash receptacles, security footage of Michelle leaning out the passenger seat of the Ford pickup and either placing something on the ground or picking up an item, and blood DNA that matched to Jennifer inside the truck. Now, while you may think that this is a slam dunk case, it's not, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. So authorities laid out their entire theory of what they believe happened that day, and it starts to make your head spin a little bit. So I apologize if I lose you here. Try to follow along as best as you can. So they lay out their theory of what happened through these detailed arrest warrants. And it all started with this old Tacoma truck that actually belonged to one of Fotis's employees. Police believe Fotis took this truck without permission on the day that Jennifer disappeared and then drove it to Connecticut. At 7.57 a.m., police found this video from a passing school bus of the Tacoma on the side of the road. It was approximately 100 feet from where they ended up recovering Jennifer's Suburban. In one of the videos of the Tacoma, police spotted a bicycle tire in the bed of the truck, and this led them to believe that Fotis bike 
hiked the over three miles to Jennifer's house in Connecticut. Investigators believe that Fotis arrived by bike to Jennifer's home due to the tire marks and other evidence that were found on the grounds, and they believe that he was lying in wait for his estranged wife to come home after dropping the children off at school and then blitz attack her in the garage. Authorities say then Fotis spent the next couple of hours cleaning up the scene, but unfortunately for him, he left behind two key pieces of evidence, that mixture of blood of his and Jennifer's on that kitchen faucet and his DNA on the doorknob. At 10.25 a.m., that video shows Jennifer's Suburban leaving her home, and police believe that Fotis was the one behind the wheel and that Jennifer was already either deceased or unconscious in the back. Police then believe that Fotis drove Jennifer's Suburban to Waveney Park and transferred her body into the Tacoma that belonged to his employee. The truck is spotted on the highway surveillance camera, and it's headed back north towards where Fotis lives. Then, five days later, police find another video of Fotis once again driving this Tacoma without permission, and he was headed now to a local car wash and detail shop, and Michelle Traconius was in the SUV seen driving behind him. Here you can actually see that Fotis is pictured in the car wash lobby, dropping the Tacoma off to be detailed, and then he gets into Michelle's vehicle. Police also say it's Fotis here who you can see taking out cash to pay for the cleaning of the Tacoma. Police say that despite his effort, they were still able to find traces of Jennifer's DNA on the passenger seat. So he's now trying to bring in a car that doesn't even belong to him. So hopefully, assuming that people aren't going to search that car, or try to find evidence. Then he goes and takes it to get detailed and cleaned out while his girlfriend's picking him up and driving him to all these stops along the way, trying to cover his tracks. I mean, in my opinion, definitely trying to cover your tracks if you are not guilty of doing something sinister or foul play. So now this is the part where you would normally think, okay, case closed. They have the alleged killers in custody, they have plenty of evidence, and there will be justice for Jennifer, right? Wrong. Because in fact, that couldn't be further from the truth. And there was a twist, actually multiple, that we're just about to hit that nobody saw coming. Because there wasn't yet any direct evidence tying Fotis or Michelle to taking Jennifer's life, they still only had the tampering with evidence charges. And because of this, they were able to bail out of jail. However, luckily, that didn't last long and they were both rearrested just a short time later. On January 7th, 2020, Fotis was arrested at his home by the Connecticut State Police, and he was charged with capital murder, murder, and kidnapping in relation to Jennifer's disappearance. Michelle was also arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Now, in the very first twist of this case that nobody saw coming is Fotis's friend and former attorney, Kent Douglas Mahini, was also detained on January 7th and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. His previous attorney. Now, Kent became estranged from his wife after being accused of spousal RAPE. His wife went to South Windsor Police and told authorities that she feared Fotis and Kent were working together to kill her. After Jennifer disappeared, a shallow grave actually was discovered at a secluded property that Kent owned. And this shallow grave was filled with two bags of lime and a blue tarp, as though it was going to be the dumping grounds for somebody's remains and then concealed and with the lime trying to get rid of the smell. Luckily, no body was found in the grave and all of those items were then removed. So there you have twist number one. You have the, and that's about like one of three or one of four that we're gonna go through. You have twist number one and it's where his friend and former attorney is now charged for helping Fotis. And here we are again, where you think justice is gonna finally be served. Now all three of these people involved in this horrific crime will be held accountable, but that's not what happens. Shortly after being arrested, on January 8th, Fotis' bond was set at $6 million. He was released the following day and wasn't due to return to court until February 28th, 2020. Now, I have a whole problem with this in general because I get it that that was a very high bond amount at $6 million that set, but if you're holding somebody on capital murder, kidnapping, conspiracy, all of these things, they shouldn't even be allowed bond. That's my personal opinion. And so this is where I believe this case made its first huge mistake. Because now you're giving him the opportunity to flee, to do whatever. Because remember, he's still technically married to Jennifer. He still has access to her money. He was able to bond out at $6 million. And sure enough, while out on bail, Fotis failed to appear on January 28th to an emergency bond hearing where they were going to go over violations that he had with his house arrest orders. So investigators go to Fotis's house to see what's going on, and they discover him unresponsive. He had used a vacuum hose through the exhaust pipe of his car into the interior of his car and obviously was trying to unalive himself with carbon monoxide. He was pronounced dead just two days later. 
And he left a note behind in the car. And the note read, I refuse to spend even an hour more in jail for something I had nothing to do with. Now, are these the words of an innocent man who was wrongly accused? Or are these the words of a narcissistic coward who didn't want to face the music for what he had done? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. It's also probably worth mentioning that his lawyer at the time was trying to argue that this was in fact a gone girl situation, that Jennifer had con concocted this entire plan and it was all a ruse and she was just vanished into thin air and that Fotis was innocent in all of this and literally said that it was, she got the inspiration from the movie. Now, at some point during all of these arrests, and as everything was unfolding, Michelle and Fotis had broken up. In fact, Fotis had a new girlfriend at the time who was living with him at the time in which he passed away. And in a statement issued in May 2020, Michelle says that it was a mistake to have ever trusted Fotis, yet she maintains that she had nothing to do with Jennifer's disappearance and has no idea about her whereabouts which I find hard to believe because she's clearly stating right there, hey, I was it was a complete mistake to have trusted him, but you were driving with him. You knew what he was doing. You went to the car wash. Like, how are you now trying to say that you still don't have any information or that you don't know what he was up to? I'm not buying it. So now you may be thinking, okay, Fotis is no longer in the picture, but at least Michelle and his former attorney and friend are going to be held accountable and there will be some sort of justice for Jennifer. But here we go with another twist. Because apparently now, Fotis's friend and former attorney is a police informant. And this week, there was a major break in the case, which I'm going to give you guys here in just a second. And that information for this break in the case is suspected to have come directly from him as the informant. And this is very coincidental because this happens to also be the week in which he has to face charges that are unrelated to this case with his ex-wife. So it's my opinion that... He's an attorney. He knows how the wheels of justice spin. I believe he is trying to manufacture a deal for himself here. This last Monday, Connecticut State Police spent hours searching a property right by where Jennifer's Suburban had been recovered. The area focused on a mulch dump and they brought canines in and they searched the area for hours. At this moment, it's unclear whether any evidence has been found at the park and what that evidence was. But remember, this is just two days before this Kent attorney guy is supposed to show up in court on unrelated charges. It's a very convenient timing where there hasn't been a break in the case in over a year. And now all of a sudden, they are led to a particular place to search for evidence, possibly to recover Jennifer herself. And it's at the hands of this information from an informant, all coincidentally right before he goes to court for other charges. So is he leading them to where Jennifer's remains are? Because she still hasn't been found, guys. She still hasn't used any credit cards, any cell phones. She has been vanished since 2019. Meanwhile, Fotis's ex-girlfriend, Michelle, and his former attorney have both pled not guilty in this case. But the prosecution had previously said that they plan to call Kent, the friend, as a witness if Michelle ends up going to trial. I'm assuming they're going to be flipping on each other. It's going to get ugly now that Fotis is no longer in the picture. They're going to probably try to shift all of the blame onto him and pretend they didn't know, but they're going to pull each other down, is my opinion, as they're both sinking. I'm hopeful that we get the answer soon as to what was discovered this Monday during that search, and hopefully Kent is leading them to even more answers so that we can finally put this case to bed, because not only has Jennifer never been found, but these kids don't have answers as to where their mom is. Unfortunately, even though it wasn't proven in court because, in my opinion, Fotis took the coward's way out, they have the answers as far as what happened to their mother and who did this to their mother, but they still don't have the opportunity to properly grieve her or lay her to rest. So I'm hopeful that this guy is finally giving the information so that the children can have some level of peace. In my opinion, the motive is pretty clear. I think that Fotis wanted the children, he wanted the power, he wanted the money, and Jennifer was standing in his way of that. I also think that he wanted to start this new life with Michelle, so he somehow persuaded her and enlisted her help to help help him get rid of Jennifer and dispose of everything and cover his tracks. However, these two morons, and still, somehow people don't understand that there are cameras everywhere, whether it's a ring camera, a street cam, whatever it is, there are cameras everywhere. And these two morons go to 30 different dump sites thinking they're not going to get caught on camera. I mean, you, got, you have to be a complete idiot. Do a better job covering your tracks if you think you're being like that smart and calculated. I'm interested to know what happens in that unrelated case with Kent this week and if he gets off of any charges or if anything's lessened for him because I think that would be very indicative of whatever information he is sharing as a known informant.
And I'm very curious to know what that evidence is, if any, that they recovered on Monday during that search site, and if it is, in fact, possibly Jennifer's remains. I'm going to keep you guys updated with this case, and as everything starts to unfold, I'm hoping we do get justice for Jennifer and that her children get justice for her. And I'll keep you guys updated because I'm going to be following this very closely, especially as we learn more about the girlfriend, Michelle, and as she hopefully goes to trial and starts to share more information. So again, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do so by hitting that subscribe button below so that you get notified when these updates happen. It's just another unfortunate case of a man on a power trip threatened by his wife where he then becomes a danger and takes things into his own hands. I mean, how many times are we going to see this, guys? Stay safe, stay aware, and please, please, stay smart. Please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up on your way out and please comment below. You guys know I always say it. I love hearing from you. I want to know from you. Do you think that this truly is a gone girl situation and Fotis is innocent? Do you think Fotis is to blame? Do you think Michelle does in fact know what happened to Jennifer or do you think she was just helping him cover the tracks? What are your theories on this case with all of the information we have? Let me know in the comments below. Until the next case, guys, stay safe and have a very happy holiday season. All right, guys, talk soon. Bye.